So welcome, Peter. And uh, this is the first time we have the chance to, to have a conversation uh, at all. Uh, but today we'll speak, of course, about philosophical counseling, which is not only our common interest, but also our common practice. And of course, you have much more experience than I do. And uh, you've uh, written also a sort of uh, now classic, uh, I would say, about philosophical counseling, the title of which is Philosophical Counseling. And uh, which sort of, that was a few years ago, but it's still very useful because it sort of uh, gives, a, gives a good panorama of uh, the, this new movement. What are the different approaches, uh, debates? I found it uh, also very respectful of the different uh, points of view that are possible. But tell me, how did it start for you? How did you become a philosophical counselor? Um, well, it was, it was quite by accident, actually. Um, I was working on my uh, master's. Um, I, think, I, I think I just finished my master's degree at University of British Columbia. And uh, I was speaking with a, with a colleague, a student of mine, um, a, a fellow student. Um, I was in my 40s at that point. Um, I went back to university quite late in life, and, which is a totally different story as to why that happened. Um, but the colleague of mine was asking me what I was doing uh, during the summer. And I said, over the summer, I volunteered at a group home for men who are recovering uh, drug addicts and alcoholics. And I, what I was requested to do was to teach them critical thinking skills so that they would make better decisions in their lives. And I said, and sometimes, you know, the men approach me personally and ask me to um, help them with personal problems, family issues, relationship issues, something like that. And, and I said, so that's what I did in, in the, uh, you know, I taught critical thinking and then occasionally I would help people, uh, the men uh, overcome individual problems. And she said to me, well, that sounds like uh, philosophical counseling to me. And I said, what's that? I'd never heard of it before. And she said, oh, well, there was just a, 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 a conference here at UBC on that topic. And I said, I didn't know that. And she said, I think there's a book out about it. So I looked and it was Rand Lahab's and, and uh, uh, Tillman's book. Um, and uh, it was philosophical counseling when I started reading the essays and that I said to myself, this is what I have been doing. And I was in between my master's and my, and my, uh, my um, PhD at that point, like I said, I was sort of you know, uh, um, coasting over the summer trying to figure out what to do for my uh, doctoral thesis. And I thought, well, I'm going to put together um, a proposition, a proposal to my advisor um, that I'd like to do uh, a, my PhD on uh, a justification of philosophical counseling being a legitimate form of therapy. And so that's what it was. And when I finished my dissertation, I offered it to a publisher and, and they accepted and it became the first book. Right. So you started quite um, early, I would say. And um, when did you start really practicing with the awareness that you were doing philosophical counseling, right? Because as, as I understand uh, carefully, you, you sort of were like Monsieur Jourdain doing prose without knowing that he was doing prose just by talking, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had no idea I was doing philosophical counseling. And, and reading the, the Tillman's and, and Lehab book, um, it clarified as to what I was doing and of course helped me in, in what I was doing as well because I could see what other counselors, um, what they were doing with their approach. And it was quite diverse. The, the essays in that are, are quite diverse between practice and counseling. And, uh, and uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, essays on uh, um, you know, corporate advising and so on and so forth. There was quite a range of things offered in the book. Um, but the philosophical counseling part certainly uh, applied to me, and, and I was quite happy to read about it. Mm. Now, I may, be, I may be wrong about what the content of that book is. It may not be quite that diverse, because I haven't read the book for quite a while. Right. But that's what gave me the, an understanding of what I was actually doing. Mm. What's your take on this idea that I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying uh, currently to... Um, uh, theorize and and uh, 
and also look at it through different angles, uh, philosophical health. Do you, do you have a feeling that uh, you are participating into such an idea uh, or would you qualify differently? No, I, I, I think I would, I would call it that. Um, for, um, for people in the field and for philosophers who understand what philosophical health actually means, um, here in North America, the word philosophy is not well understood. Um, and, um, you know, we even have movies that were, you know, from Harry Potter, where the title was changed in North America, because the Philosopher's Stone would not resonate with, with viewers here. They called it whatever, I can't remember what it's called now, um, which really shocked me, because it, it, it's one of these things where I thought North Americans were not very clued in about philosophy, and the change of that movie title really confirmed it for me, right? So when you talk about philosophical health, yeah, you and I can understand roughly what that means. We may have slightly different, you know, perspectives, but, um, and I, I, I certainly agree with the importance of it, but to, um, to converse with someone, to spread the message about philosophical health, um, where I live anyway, in North America, it, it doesn't, I don't think it would serve a very good purpose. So um, the, the, the point that, you know, the, the, the approach that I take is to teach people how to, to think well, and that's you know critical thinking, and it, it's a, that's a small part of what philosophy actually is. And by teaching people to think well, um, it not only it not only helps them overcome an issue that they're involved in, which is philosophical counseling. If you have a relationship issue, you help the person think through it and make decisions as to how to how to resolve the issue. Right. Um, it also helps to prevent. So when you when you when you help people think for themselves. Um, think about philosophy for children, all right? You, you, you help that child or the adult um, add to their toolbox, the toolbox they have of, a, of ways to resolve issues and ways to think about problems, right? And that's philosophical health, that the way I understand it, um, that you have the ability to look at an issue from different perspectives, um, think about uh, different uh, consequences, decide on the one that you want as an outcome, which is moral and which is possible and so on. Um, and that's a preventive approach that you know, prevents young people from growing up to be gangsters and so on and so forth. So philosophy, philosophical health, just like in medical health, um, it helps you overcome a situation, but who wants to wait till they get sick, right? We wanna be healthy, so we, we take on a good diet to prevent the possibility of, of illness and i look at uh, philosophical health the same way that's very interesting and and uh there are two points here that i want to to unfold with you uh the first one is the distinction between thinking well and you mentioned that phrase and thinking for yourself but before we get into that um i think it's uh relevant to mention the young people uh, in the sense that there is a discourse today, uh, scientific discourse that says young people do a lot of uh, silly things, or stupid things, because their prefrontal lobe is not yet developed. Um, Ten years ago, uh, the science was saying it, it sort of gets mature at 20, now they're saying at 30. Um, and so, and even the solutions sometimes that are proposed are, oh, uh, they should do more sports, then they can focus because they're tired. And what you're saying with the preventive approach uh, echoes with one aspect of philosophical health that I find important is the adequation between our thoughts, what we find relevant in terms of values and our acts, right? Such that we don't act in contradiction with with what with what we value and this sort of um, self-reflection can be uh, for young people uh, a way to train what they supposedly are lacking which is a sense of the consequence of of their behavior of their acts yeah i totally agree with you yeah and and yeah, so yeah. But, uh, let's go back to something that is actually related thinking well and thinking for yourself 
is that would you say it's the same thing? Um, no, it's not. And and I, I want to, if I if I may, just go back a step to something you said about the prefrontal lobe. I I I've been writing lately about uh, helping people to try and avoid blaming their brain, um, which is again very pervasive in our society. So if someone makes a bad decision, oh, their prefrontal lobe is not developed very well. And maybe we've got a drug that will help that. You know, that's, that's the, the step, to, that's the sequence of events in, in North American culture, right? Um, it's very important for children to grow up in a home where, where parents make good decisions. And if the parents aren't able to make good decisions, the child's not gonna learn that either. Um, you don't learn making good decisions in school until you get to university where you can take you know, philosophy and critical thinking classes. So what, what is it that trains a person to think well? Um, they can think for themselves and it doesn't stop someone from getting into trouble um, because their decisions, they have a certain number, and I use the, the term loosely here, they have a certain number of tools to work with, right? They can ask their friends if the, if the decision is difficult, they can ask their friends. The friends are limited by the tools they have in their toolbox. And of course, the tools that we have are culturally relevant. They're, they're the things that we get from our culture. That's why travel is so in, important for young people to understand how other cultures think and act and behave and so on, right? Um, so what, what, you can, what, what happens is young people or anybody works with the tools they have and, and or they ask their friends and relatives who work with the tools they have, which may add 10% to what they've got now for a toolbox. And it still doesn't, it still doesn't solve the problem, so to speak, in their life. Um, and that's where a philosophical counselor comes in or a philosopher or whatever, um, where, where the tools that we have in our toolbox as philosophers are really extensive. And I've got a, I've got a shelf full of tools behind me that are called books. And if I don't know something, I can look it up. But not many people have the kind of philosophy books that you and I have in our libraries at home, right? So, so thinking for yourself is, is limited. There's, a, there's a, a range of ability you have by thinking all by yourself. Um, and, and most people realize they get to a point where they get stuck and they can't think, you know, the teacher says, well, think harder. How do you do that? How do you, you know, children have to be taught how to think about things. And so what happens is when, when people can't resolve an issue, they talk to their friends, but we are there as philosophical counselors and say, look, We've got the tools, we've got the expertise that we can help you with, right? Not that we're gonna tell you what to think because, well, uh, Hume said such and such or Spinoza said such and such, you know, you should do what they said. That's, that's not the way we work, right? We say, well, here's the, the perspective they took and, and it's something to offer to, to the client uh, for them to, to think about and perhaps accept or, or not. And then you go on to the next uh, suggestion. So again, your question about, uh, about thinking for yourself um, is very different for, from being able to think well for yourself, right? Right. Uh, and so it's interesting because that sort of uh, might explain uh, why I didn't know this anecdote about Harry Potter. Now I'm very curious about the title of the American book because maybe that, that, that could be useful for us. But... There is this idea that is not only American that philosophy is very unpractical, right? So philosophers are are these people who, who keep banging their head uh, on doors because they are thinking about uh, big ideas. And actually, the more they do so, or the more someone might be interested by this uh, deep questions, the more that person actually might be in danger of of um, doing everything wrong with the domestics or the logistics of uh, her or, or, or his life, right? So I think there is, might be this sort of almost fear of the philosophical domain in a country uh, in like maybe the US and Canada are a little bit different. We can talk about that later, but in a place where the, the pragmatics of life are so important, right? The effectuality, being effective. And, and uh, uh, so now what you're saying about the tools, I think comes from 
a, a sort of a overarching idea that we know, we are convinced that philosophy is actually generative. It's very useful uh, and very pragmatic, in fact, in, because there is a deep connection between our ideas, whether these ideas are very clear or implicit or, or working as uh, ideologies or fixed ideas within, within our subconscious and the way we act. And this comes uh, all the way back, uh, as of course you know very well, uh, to the Greeks who, who were well aware that philosophy, philosophizing was a way uh, to become a better citizen a better active citizen. And so what I believe that what we're trying to do with this concept of philosophical health and in practice with philosophical counseling is that we're really trying to democratize this empowering uh, disposition that allows uh, ideas to be social forces when they are well uh, calibrated. Uh, and so, of course, many f professionals philosophers would disagree with us, right? They would, they be would be uh, some of them would be outraged at the idea that oh, that philosophers are giving tools for a better life, right? Uh, but but I think that I, I I I deeply agree with you, and it's interesting when we reread philosophers who, of course, are also trying to to solve cosmological questions or questions of uh, you know the logical coherence of, of, of reality etc but they are also many of them you, you mentioned Spinoza there are many of the many of them trying to answer the question what can a philosophical conviction do you know Spinoza said what can a body do but we could say what can a philosophical belief do and so your experience, because nevertheless, you've been, uh, uh, and perhaps, uh, and, and I, I, maybe you're still, uh, you, you're still practicing, uh, the, you, you've helping many people from North America, nevertheless. So your experience is that there is a space, even, even in a country that, that takes out the, the word philosopher from from mainstream uh, entertainment, you you do your experience that there is a space for it, and that and that it it sort of it works. You could say that's a really good question and, and, a, and an interesting perspective. Um, I I have the experience of um, um, of writing a book called "The Philosophy's Role in Counseling and Psychotherapy." That's that was one of my latest books. You may have, you may have seen it. Um, and it has been reviewed by one, uh, I, I'm not sure, psychologist, psychiatrist, something like that, as being, uh, as being uh, way too simple, as being, um, <laughs> you know, as, as, as having dumbed down the information. So as a writer, I find myself stuck in the middle, okay? When I write really strong philosophical, what I think are strong philosophical uh, essays, I don't, I don't write books like that for a good reason. Um, when I write strong essays, those essays are read by other philosophers who understand them. At least I assume that because I, you know, I get feedback, right? Um, when I look at the public out there, what I see them craving for is understanding of the stuff that philosophers are playing with. And I'm using the word playing because there's a lot of material that's written that's only read by other philosophers. And the question is, what's the point? What good is that? Right? So if you're going to, as a philosopher, help society, you have to think about, okay, at what level is society reading? In North America, the level of reading uh, comprehension is, is quite low, in my opinion. And when it comes to philosophy, it's very, very low. So what, what we have in North America is a lot of sort of self-help books. Okay, The latest one, the latest fad, is uh, the, the recent fad was, was about positive psychology, which is helping people that isn't always critical of what's wrong with them. It's giving them tools to live a better life. And I'm thinking positive psychology, isn't that what philosophy has been doing for centuries? Okay, that was, that was one fad that's gone now. 
apart from Schopenhauer, who was okay. doing negative psychology. Um, and the latest fad is is the one with uh, with with mindfulness, right? And that goes right back to ancient Greece. And and don't ask me to quote who it was or, but the the uh, the expression over the the gate that says "Know thyself," right? That's mindfulness. So we're talking about two thousand some odd years of history of philosophy trying to get people to be mindful of themselves, to understand why they believe what they believe and, and to, to decide what they want to keep and what they want to get rid of, right? And, and yet we have this latest fad of mindfulness books coming out. And when you read those books, they are philosophy at, at a very, very low level. They're extremely watered down. And, and that's what the general public needs. If you want to help people improve their lives, you have to write at a level that people can understand the material. And, and I see a huge division between the self-help books on one hand, which, which to me are extremely boring, and, and the philosophy books on the other hand, which, which often are very difficult to read, like Heidegger and, and what have you, right? There's, there's very little in between that's, that's solid, um, um, solid food, so to speak. We have, we have baby pablum on one hand, and we have we have exotic meals on the other hand that people cannot afford to spend the time on, right? Right. So that that middle ground is is really lacking. Mm. I th I think that's really interesting because uh, among other points, uh, two two notions there. The first one is the idea of simplicity, which you brought up uh, via the the critique that was. Uh, made to to your book and and I think that's an epistemological question in the sense to use a unsimple word but in the in the sense that when a philosopher uses s a s s what might sound today like a simple approach for example Spinoza when Spinoza says there is basically just one emotion it's joy and all the others are are sort of modulations on joy uh, and joy is the feeling that your your power over the world uh, is is increased let's say to put it in in a simple way and there is a reason a philosophical reason sometimes for choosing simple terms especially today where uh, the psychotherapeutic field has been invaded by very a norm a very normative nomenclatura whether it's psychoanalysis with all its uh concepts from oedipus to to transference etc uh and, and each let's say each approach has its jargon right uh you take the dsm5 and you you have this very uh uh this long list of, of syndromes uh I, one of my games is I, I invent new ones just for the, the fun of it. For example, you have the red carpet syndrome. So red carpet syndrome is this syndrome that people have today that why is society not unfolding a red carpet for me? I'm so unique, right? Or, or for my community. But so more, so I think that it, it, in a way it can be healthy to go back to simple words like you know instead of saying you have a uh you know a obsessive compulsive this depressional uh, disorder say you maybe may you you let's say that you're sad why are you sad right uh now on the other hand there is sometimes use of simplification without justification and then you have these books that i agree with you are more or less all formatted the same and also based very much on this idea of will, right? So if you want, you can. And I think that philosophers are very rarely uh, saying that. Uh, they are very much often trying to find uh, a sort of um, an understanding for how there can be a necessity, ethical necessity in your life, such that if you consistently uh, believe in a certain value, 
uh, and then you repeat certain actions, then this will create a reality because reality is often created by repetition. Uh, and the other point is that why is, is sometimes philosophy not uh, contemplated directly at actually, indeed, as you were saying, a tradition that has explored all these new fads before? is perhaps that there is today the idea that if something is exotic coming from abroad or, or, or the Middle East or, 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 or uh, China or India, then it, it's more exotic. So it, it, it's, it's nicer, right? So mindfulness, for example, is a, 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 it's often presented as, as a, something inspired by Buddhism, etc. And so... We have, we, we tend to, I think as Westerners, we also tend to forget our own spiritual traditions. It's philosophy being one. I think uh, it's, it's Michel Foucault who actually, and, and, uh, and Pierre Hadot who are two figures that pointed the fact that the Greeks were using philosophy as, as a, a way towards the good life. And, um, and they, they, I mean, we, we, are, we tend to forget that we have these traditions within ourselves, whether it's, the, for example, the mystical tradition in, in Europe, in the Middle Age Europe, right? So when we look for mysticism, we prefer to look also again as, at, at uh, China or, or India. But so I think it's a good... Um, I think it's a good idea. And I think more and more people are, are actually uh, turning to philosophy to, to, help, to help them articulate meaning in their life. But then we could be critical and say, and observe, or whatever, observe. I don't know if you agree with me that many people discover philosophy as a way of life through stoicism. Sorry. And... Uh, and this idea that, well, it's about accepting life as it is. And I find that politically significant that stoicism, even in the production of self-help books, because there are now a few that are presenting themselves as philosophical, they are selling stoicism, which I find politically actually a bit dangerous in the sense that they're selling the idea that philosophy is about renunciation, but philosophy can also be about, you know, combat and, and, and uh, idealism and, and transformation. But fair enough, maybe that's, maybe that's one way to, uh, to enter the field. And maybe people, if they read Stoicism, then they will discover other, other aspects of, um, of philosophy. But my question, and you can, of course, comment on what I've said, but my question was uh, also about your practice. It's like, tell us more about your practical experiences of counseling. Like, for example, if you have one, of course, uh, anonymously uh, one one case that was really a moment a significant moment of your of your life of counselor that we'd like to share wow um, um yeah i have i have very few clients at the moment because i'm i'm retired from teaching and, and i've sort of drawn back from <clears throat> from having uh, personal uh sessions um because i did that for what 15 years or something and i and um, you do you do reach a point where, um, especially because I was involved in academics, where the face to face counseling um, is a lot of extra work, and and it, it requires a particular mindset and so on. But but that having said that, so I, I'm not I, I have I have two clients right now, and I, I work by phone, which you know it saves me having to open my home to people and so on. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. And of course, with COVID, it, it's very risky to have clients anyway. So everything's been, you know, pulled way back, just like other businesses. Mine is very much pulled back. Um, 
but I, I want to, okay, you, you made so many points, it's really hard to answer them all. Um, the, the thing about jargon, I really hate that word <clears throat> because jargon suggests that you're doing something really stupid and silly, right? You're putting funny words and, and I know you're doing it for a purpose and I understand that. But when I get accused or, or when I hear people accusing philosophy of using uh, jargon, like my students sometimes have said that, I say to them, well, every um, profession has its jargon, but they don't call it jargon. They call it technical language, right? They call it their professional language. And the reason we have that is it, it makes discussion simple. So when I say existentialism, you know exactly what it means. I don't have to, I don't have to say, by the way, which is blah, 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 before you understand what I'm talking about. And then I forgot my thought anyway at that point, right? So jargon is professional language that is, is a, a shortcut, so to speak, right? So, um, but, but it's a professional language. No doctor, in, in my experience anyway, will, will tell a patient in medical terms what's wrong with them unless the patient specifically asks, well, what is that? Right? The doctor, in a sense, puts it in simple terms for the patient to understand in, in the medical field. And, and what I'm saying is that this is, happens in philosophy too. You have discussions in philosophy that are appropriate between professionals, and you have discussions in counseling that would not be appropriate with a bunch of jargon. So when I say to someone, you know, you have the right to make your own decisions in your life at your age, you can live your life the way you want, all you have to do is choose. I'm not going to then use all the expressions from, you know, authenticity and all, all those expressions that Sartre came up with to explain existentialism, right? I'm not using the jargon when I speak to clients, and that's important. And that can scare clients away, too, when you use the jargon, because they can't keep up with you. They don't know what you're talking about, right? <clears throat> the other thing that um, you mentioned is, is about um, um, stoicism. And one of my clients that I have right now um, is, was, was really into stoicism um, because he lived a very, very um, troubling life as a, as a young person. <clears throat> very, very difficult family situation um, with, with a fairly um, brutal father from what I understand, from what he told me. And for him, stoicism was totally appropriate to a point, okay? But the where I draw the line is to, to when you, when people look at stoicism is just putting up with what you're given, putting up what life, what life throws at you and, and don't complain, just adapt. Right. And there's, like you said, politically, there's a problem with that. If you've got a government that's on the brink of becoming a dictatorship, is it a really good idea to just go along with it and just adapt yourself to the dictatorship? And for most people, the answer would be, no, you're crazy. We don't want that. We want democracy, right? Or whatever the situation is, there's a limit to the usefulness of Stoicism. And, and because people don't understand the history of Stoicism, they apply it to modern day situations and books come out you know, about how to be a Stoic in today's life. I told my client right out, I said to him, Stoicism can kill you, right? Mm -hmm. if, you if you just take a, a really strong attitude towards whatever sickness you have, and you just say, I'm going to be stoic and put up with whatever pain I'm suffering from. You can end your life that way very easily, right? So there's a limit to stoicism, but that's not presented in most books that, that I'm familiar with. And I don't read a lot of mm. you know, current help, self-help stoic books. But you see what I'm saying? There, you know, the understanding of philosophy is lacking. Mm. So we have, we, have, we have students going into counseling that, that, you know, and I'm slightly off track here, but, but I'm sure you'll, you'll forgive me. And we have students who go into counseling who understand the, the technique of counseling. They understand the technique of existential therapy, okay, or rational motive behavior therapy, which is critical thinking skills. They understand the techniques, but they don't have the understanding of the philosophy behind them. Mm. The same with, with Stoicism. People, people promote the idea in their books and what have you, in their, in their groups and what have you, of stoicism, but they don't understand where it came from, where it was meant for soldiers and poor people who had to put up with incredibly difficult situations in life, right? That could that could often, you know, it, 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 if you're in war and you're a stoic, you can get killed that way pretty easily, right? 
So that that's my take on, and I, I'm not sure if I've answered all the different points you're making because you you bring out a lot of points, and, and you really stimulate my thinking. By the way, I appreciate that. Well, thanks. That's mutual, and um, that's a very um, good point. I think I share that um, conviction that if you want to be a philosophical counselor, you you need to dig into the you know the, you need to have a deep knowledge of the history of philosophy and the text etc otherwise you can do something else can i just jump in here for, for one second yeah, sure. um that when i first started teaching my course in, in philosophy for counselors i actually advertised it to our students in my university as philosophical counseling okay and i advertise it to philosophy students and like the first time i taught that the first semester i think i had five students that signed up for the class which was very disappointing right and I, I talked to some of the students and, and, you know, as to, you know, why is it there's so few of you? And, and basically what it came out to was, well, philosophy students, if you've advertised it to philosophy students, they don't want to be doing counseling. They want to do this, this philosophy stuff, this high level thinking stuff. That's what they right. want to be doing in the class. So what I did after that is I advertised the course to students who wanted to become counselors and psychotherapists. Mm. And I changed the title of the course. And I call it philosophy for counselors. Mm. And and now every time I well not now because I'm not teaching anymore but every time I taught the course after that I've had overflow classes with standing room only because the students mm. that sign up for it are students who want to already help people mm. right and I'm glad that in the second uh, title of your your course you kept the word philosophy that that's important absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> and and by the way speaking of title. Stoicism will kill you. That's a very good title. <laughs> you should do a, a self-help book again. All the self self-help books to advocate Stoic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to give an example because um, some people might be wondering here. But what is it really that they're doing? And I want to give this just an anonymous, very brief example uh, of uh, one person that came to me and was a. Uh, uh, a man of, of, you know, in the middle 50s and came to me because he, I mean, he felt lonely and he, he had no family, he never had a child and, and he, he wanted to talk about that. And, uh, uh, you know, a long hour conversation was just the first session. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, he, he wanted to find love. Uh, he expressed the need to find love and, and, and to, to have a child and to have a family. And then when I asked him to, to describe what women want, because he wanted love with a woman, he defined it as, you know, women want someone that has money, someone that has a house, someone that has a job, <laughs> uh, someone that dresses well. And, and so, you know, I, I, I led him to understand the contradiction between, on the one hand, a philosophical stance that was idealism, this idea that love is desirable and, and, and as a spiritual, non-material uh, good. And on the one hand, the vision of, of women that he had that was typical of uh, cynicism, which is another uh, which is a school of philosophy, by the way. And so what I told him, because I, 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 mean, I, I try to be, especially in the first session, not to be judgmental, I told me, well, right now, at this stage, I'm not telling you be an idealist rather than a cynic, which, which I think people should be. But I just told him, you need to make a choice here for the sake of coherence because your sort of div mindset division between two opposite systems of thought might be precisely what prevents you from finding love. And then uh, more details is that when he described the way he was trying to find love, he was going after married women. So this was very problematic, right? So this is just to give an example of the kind of uh, discussions we can have. It's like, like we show that behind behaviors, there are uh, belief systems, assumptions, and 
and that when two belief systems are contradictory, that has an impact on life. And that impact can be really, really sad and painful, such that we are alone uh, in life and, and, and we feel you know, more or less uh, desperate. So I just wanted to, to add that example. Perhaps you want to that you know, uh, triggered another thought or example um, uh, from the past that you would like to. I know, for example, that you've written a book on, on women in philosophical counseling. Would you like to say a bit about that? Yeah, the, the whole idea of, of um, maybe I can give you a little bit more background. Um, I was born and raised a fundamentalist Christian. And there were beliefs that I grew up with that were absolutely rock solid. <clears throat> this is what we believe and everything else is false and so on and so forth. And we were taught basically that, that questioning was um, you could really ask wrong questions, bad questions. And so the, the belief system I grew up in is religion. And I wanted to clarify that was, that was part of what you talked about earlier. This, this um, philosophy can be looked at like a religion. I, I, would, really I would really disagree with you. Um, I have lived religion and it's very different from philosophy where there are clear boundaries as to what you can, what you're allowed to and what you're not allowed to believe. Right. Um, so, and it took me a long time to get over that. Um, I, I, I call, I had what I call was religious hangover for a long time where, where my religious beliefs would interfere with my daily thinking. Even while I was studying to be a philosopher, my religious beliefs would pop up every once in a while. Um, so, and, and those beliefs certainly absolutely, you're absolutely right. The beliefs that you have determine how you live your life and determine what other beliefs you accept or don't believe. And this is why I, I talk about philosophy being um, the, the attempt to, to examine your beliefs and your values and so on, so that you're not guided by them, you're not controlled by them, that you decide where they came from and whether you want to keep them or not. And the only way you can decide whether you want to keep them or not is by looking at other beliefs and other values and, and making a choice and then coming to a choice that is moral for one thing and, and reasonable in, in whatever, wherever you live, whatever society you're part of, right? So I, I totally agree with you. The, the fact that, that um, there are people who are raised, and again, I've got a, a couple of clients like that, who have um, beliefs that are, are, in my opinion, really problematic because they're supposed to, for example, love family members that treat them terrifically miserably, um, according to what they've told me, right? There's a super contradiction. And by the way, that's been argued in a number of books um, as to a, a possible beginning for schizophrenia, if there is such a thing as schizophrenia, okay? And I, I dispute that. Um, where, where people are, uh, as young people, are raised with conflicting um, beliefs and, and values and so on where parents, for example, say, I love you, and they don't hesitate to, to, you know, to harm the child, right? Um, the, the old, I love you, but don't touch me kind of thing, right? Um, and, and so beliefs can have, you know, and, and the, the things that you believe and value can have such a huge impact on you. But I want to be very clear that I differentiate the beliefs that we have that we don't think about every single day, right? I believe, for example, my car is parked in the parking lot out here, but I'm not thinking about it until just now. I, I just totally forgot about it. Doesn't mean it's gone, it's still there. But there are there is this belief about the unconscious or the subconscious, whatever. I, I think, what, what's the term that Freud uses? Is it unconscious or subconscious? I think it's the unconscious. Unconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where you have no access to that, right? And it it, it controls your life. And, and people worry, my, my clients, because of, some of them have had psychotherapy and so on, have come up with this a whole idea of, well, there's this, you know, my unconscious, you know, and I, I always tell them, don't buy into that, that you're, it's like saying your brain is making you do things. What happens to free will at that point? If you say you're doing this because of some unconscious thing, seek, you know, search it out, see what it is that your belief is that you're now behaving, that that's now driving you to behave a certain way. What is it you believe about the situation? Like, like your client, like you said, two different things that conflict that's, that's driving his life to be miserable, right? Those are not unconscious things. They can be- Well, it was not 
he was not conscious about them in a way we could say we could argue right but that doesn't mean it was the unconscious uh, exactly right exactly yeah so yeah i mean again i i totally agree with you that that um you know what you believe and what you value uh, and what you fear um and those things the trouble is those things can be, things can be diagnosed as mental illnesses too that's that's another whole discussion topic, right? But actually, uh, of course, we there are so many topics, uh, and and we'll we'll finish in a few minutes uh, for today. But I think we, I'd like to finish on that question because you you have a very strong uh, opinion that I find extremely interesting on on the fact that many of the so called uh, mental diseases that are labeled uh, are actually uh, uh, wrong categorizations of of sort of more uh, philosophical or or cognitive, um, you know, um, dissonances or or uh, constructions. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, the the place to start is to um, to see that in in psychotherapy and, and psychoanalysis and so on uh, in in the in the world right now of mental health care there's a, a huge confusion. You talk about, you talk about, um, you know, um, contradictory messages that people live with, huge confusion between the brain and the mind. There are many books that, that I've read that say point blank that the brain is the same thing as the mind. The mind is the same thing as the brain, which is interesting because you can get brain cancer, but I've never heard of mind cancer. Um, so, you know, what's going on here? Well, the brain is an organ, like a kidney or the heart or the liver. And it can be, you can take it out and look at it, you can point your finger at it. It has external reality to your body. Um, the mind doesn't have that. It doesn't have any of that. The mind, in my opinion, is your beliefs, your values, your thoughts. Okay. And, and that's who you are. You are not your brain. You are your mind. You are your beliefs, values. That's how people know you is by what you believe, by what you think, by what you, what you fear and so on, right? And, and when, when they talk about mental illnesses, what they're really talking about sometimes is brain diseases. So you can have Alzheimer's, you can have Tourette syndrome, you can have uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. And those things affect your brain and they affect your thinking, okay? And they're caused by the brain malfunction, some kind of malfunction, okay? Mental illnesses are not caused by the brain. They're in a sense caused by your thinking. So you can have, you, you can, for example, you, you can be, how does it go here? Um, you're not suffering from depression. You're depressed about something. If you use the terminology that you're suffering from depression, you're in a sense reifying, you're making depression into something real, which it isn't. Mm -hmm. Depression is, is what you're thinking about, what you believe, right? If you say you're suffering uh, from anxiety, same problem. You're not, you're anxious about something, right? Mm -hmm. And that differentiates the brain, which has causal uh, explanations for what's going on to um, the mind, which has a different kind of causal thing because the mind is, is not a physical entity. It's right. your beliefs and values and so on collected. So when I, um, I wrote in one of my essays that, that when people talk about philosophy of mind, as though you can study one mind and understand minds, um, it's really a mistake. You can say you can study brain, the brain, you can study the brain, because most of people's, most of our brains are very, very similar, very almost identical, right? But you can't say study a mind and know everybody's minds. Why? Because everybody's beliefs, values, fears, assumptions, hopes, all those things are very, very different. You and I, our, our minds are very unique, but your, our brains are not, mm. okay? And that's the big difference. And the problem in psychiatry, um, here's a metaphor I use quite often. The problem in psychiatry, and, and um, especially biological psychiatry, is that they're studying um, a book, okay? And the book is you, but the book is not you, okay? The story in the book is you. And what psychiatry does is they open up the book and they study the paper, the pages, and they study the ink spots. And they figure that's the way to figure out what the story is all about. And it's not. The story is the book. The story is the story, okay? The story is not the, the physical properties of the book. And so there's a huge problem in the research right now 
when it comes to uh, neurological research. They're studying the brain. And I, I asked my, you know, I asked my students when I was still teaching, I would say things like, well, does your brain make a date with your girlfriend? Does your brain decide what car you're going to buy? No, it's you. It's your beliefs and your values and your hopes and your preferences and so on. And that's mind, okay? But you can't put, you can't put um, the mind uh, in the same category as you can put the brain, which is a physical thing. Hmm. That's, a short, but, that's a long answer to a short question. Yes, no, but that's, this is a very important topic. And I, I like the metaphor of the book. And we could say that uh, as philosophical counselors, we, we try to help people write their own book and not exactly. just the, the puppet in the story written by others. Yeah. Uh, there's so much in what you said, which is, for example, the cognitive diversity aspect, uh, right? The, 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 how do we philosophically and politically uh, favor a world where cognitive diversity um, thrives in, in a way that creates more possibilities, uh, more ways, new ways of life. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, there is a, a mental health approach today, which is connected to uh, industrialism uh, that tends to, on the country, uh, uh, have a mono, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say monomaniac, uh, but, you know, a very um, standard view of, of what uh, uh, a person is and that is of course connected to the fact that there is a huge industry of medication so we we're not going to go into into that but that's of course the reification of depression that you were talking about and of course we're not saying that depression does not exist uh, phenomenologically as something that peeps, people might might feel and then we put a label but very often those labels are connected to uh, some form of, of medication, uh, sedation, and, and there's a problem there. So there's, I mean, uh, what I, I see is that this was just an introduction. Um, nevertheless, I suggest we, we, we conclude here, um, but this was really interesting. Is there any final word that you would like to, uh, to conclude with, for example, I really like our, your idea uh, that uh, stoicism will kill you. So what, if you tell that to, to your patient, your patient who, who was a stoic, uh, what, what else would you tell him? Uh, what counter, what antidote to stoicism would you propose? That's, that's a really good question. And I meant to mention that, and I, it slipped my mind because we're talking about so many different things. Um, what I suggested, or not suggested, but what I got him to think about was the fact that he's not the problem. It's not his adaptation that's at fault for where he is in his life. It, it, it was a situation he grew up in, the society he grew up in, the family he grew up in. And so I said to him, you know, the responsibility is not you and your bad thinking. The responsibility is how you were raised in your family and, and abused in the family in a society that got away with it, and the family got away with it. And that um, was a turning point, I felt anyway. I, I could hear the click in the, in the, in the mind of, of my client at the other end of the phone when he went, wow, it's not about me. It's about how I was raised. It's about how I was, I was forced to live and what I was forced to believe. And I said, yeah. And this is the problem with stoicism is it says, just put up with it, kiddo, you know? Um, whereas I said, what I'm trying to teach you is, is to how to think for yourself and decide how to live your life on your own. So, so that was a big thing. It was not just I was warning him about stoicism, but I was, I was offering him existentialism without throwing another ism in there um, to, to make the, the, the pot you know, much murkier. Right? right, right, right. And then also the idea that once we have identified the negative determinisms of our past, then we shouldn't have bad faith, you know, the Sartrean bad faith about it in the sense that, okay, we, we're not going to pose as victims forever. We can, from that start, and then many people have, of course, different starts, but many people would have reasons to complain about uh, their yeah. past, what to do about it. 
this is another this is another really interesting point to an important point too. the difference between blame and responsibility. OK, so um, and the same, you know, the same conversation with the same client, I said to him, your parents and, and where you grew up, the neighborhood and so on, were responsible for what you believe and what you value and what you feel and what you fear. But it, it's hard. It's difficult to to hold them uh, to blame because your parents were probably doing what their parents taught them to do was a good way to raise their child. So I said, you know, and, and this is difficult for someone who's been abused by their parents, right? I said, you know, they were doing the best they knew how um, and they victimized you, okay? The trick now is for you, when you have children, uh, he was in, he was in, like in his 25, 30, something like that. I said, it's not to, not to then copy that, not to carry that lineage of, of that, you know, the, the abuse to your children, right? Because otherwise, who do you blame? Well, you can, you can hold people responsible back into infinity. What, your grandparents, your great grandparents, you know, on and on and on. Where did it begin? Somebody has to stop in and uh, step in and say, I'm going to stop it here. I'm not going to do this anymore. So the lesson that, that I tried to, I said to him, that this, the lesson you might want to learn is the fact that you don't need to be like your parents. Right, that that this is that this is not going to, you know, and people are worried about that too. I've had other I've had other clients who are worried about I'm going to be just like my parents when I grow up because I yelled at my child today. And I said, you know, you don't have to be that way. You can be the new beginning to the to your lineage to your family line um, by what you do. I, I I literally had the same experience with my family. I mean, not that I was abused, um, but my my family were not a huggy type of people. And, and one visit that we made to my family, they, they're at the other end of the country. Um, I actually decided to give my sister a hug and she said, oh, I didn't know we were huggy people. And I said, well, we can change that. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, right? well, that's, a, that's I, I think, a very beautiful conclusion. We'll end with that idea of new beginnings, okay. right? And uh, stoicism will kill you, but existentialism will, you, will bring you back to life. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Peter.